Hi, Catherine. Hi, Rocky. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you, especially because the sun's out so beautifully. It's such a lovely day today. Um, and so thank you so much for for probably shutting all your windows and, and doors and, and, and staying in to answer our our questions um about about yoga and in in particular about um scaravelli yoga which uh which is something that i think i first tried out a, a few years ago but i i wasn't at all sure what it what it was so in fact my first question was i think i came to uh, one of your classes in in London and I had I had no idea what 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 it was I was going to be doing and um and yeah it was I was like oh wow this is this is something a little bit uh different so that was my my very first introduction to to Scaravelli and then uh, also I've done lots of your classes on movement uh for modern life and in fact my my favorite classes is the the class um about feet that is an absolute all-time uh favorite class um of mine and um i know i know because people always think that's really strange you're 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 really strange but I, I found that that class makes like just absolutely invigorates me and has me feeling really buzzy the next day as well so i i often return to it um but but yes it, it but that's that's just my my little history and stumbling on scaravelli yoga and then i i bought awakening the spine um which is a which is a book i really enjoy so that that's just a my little insight but i'm going to ask you to to answer the question what is scaravelli yoga good question um and it's one that lots of people ask, understandably, because there are so many kinds of different kinds of yoga around these days. And everything seems to have its own unique selling point, its own USP, um, whether you're talking mindful yoga or restorative yoga or vinyasa or I don't know. Uh, there's probably going to be yoga for cats shortly if there isn't already. I know there's dog yoga and baby yoga and I don't know gin yoga um <laughs> so what is scaravelli yoga is uh, it's a big question essentially it's yoga it is just yoga it's just it has a, a particular slant it was um it's named after vanda scaravelli who was a concert pianist who began yoga at the age of around 47 she started yoga Almost by accident, um, she was very good friends with the philosopher Krishnamurti, Jiddu Krishnamurti, and he used to come and stay in her villa in Florence for the summer. And he would bring Iyengar with him to teach him yoga one-to-one. -one. And, you know, in the way of these things, Iyengar started teaching Vanda, and she just lost, tragically lost her husband and was feeling very down, very depressed, nothing really going on. And so I think he he worked her really hard in the way that you do work really hard in Iyengar. But she had a scoliosis, quite a severe scoliosis, which is a curvature, an S-shaped curvature of the spine. Um, and so once he'd gone, once Iyengar had left the villa and gone on his world tour, um, she was left alone with Krishnamurti and her other friends, and she started to adapt the practice that she'd been given by Ayenga to suit her and specifically to suit Krishnamurti, who, my understanding, because I don't know him, obviously, um, he was fairly stiff and found it quite difficult to do the very extreme positions. So she adapted things. And she found a way of working with her own subtle rigidities in her body and her spine, which she found profoundly helpful. And Scaravelli isn't really that different from any other form of yoga, except that we're 
I suppose, famous for changing the standing positions. So instead of doing the long stride um, standing poses like Trikonasana, very long, we tend to do them shorter and keep them much more like a stepping forward bend with a twist kind of thing. So we've moderated, modified those poses. But everything else is pretty much the same. Um, the one thing that I will say about Scaravelli is following on from her relationship with Krishnamurti, Scaravelli took the view um, that really it's all about what you learn for yourself, for your own body, um, not listening blindly almost to a teacher. So she more than perhaps any other teacher that I know, is all about one size does not fit all. You have to do things in a way that suits you. And that might mean that you teach yoga and you practice yoga in a very different way from other Scaravelli teachers. So, for instance, Vanda taught about five different people individually who then became the, the senior Scaravelli inspired teachers around the world and they each teach really differently like Sandra Sabatini her work is focused almost exclusively on breath and really quite subtle movement whereas Diane Long will go into full back bends headstands the works um, and if you go to each of those teachers and any of the others as well you wouldn't necessarily understand that there is a, a thread that joins them. So if you come to my class, it might be very different from one of my colleagues or one of the people who I've trained. I would encourage them to go off in the path that suits them, that works with their anatomy, their psyche, their approach to life, the universe and everything. So I, there's, there's a lot of, I think, wisdom in in that really, in that listening to your own body and to your needs rather than blindly following what someone says because, of course, how could they possibly know what it feels like um, inside you? And I think that's what I've always appreciated in, in the, the Scarabelli classes I've done is, is that sense of you, you really have to be focused in on what's happening inside yourself and 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 how your anatomy works rather than just listening to almost um, I was going to say an abstract um, instruction but a, a very dogmatic instruction of place your foot here rather than thinking mm -hmm. about my legs are this long and my hips do that so I, I think there is that in amazing amount of real focus on on what's right for for you um as well but I, I i'm i'm interested in how you came to 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 teach it in the way that you do because you've i think you've had a, a lifelong movement practice haven't mm. you really um so what, yeah. what was your journey so i i wanted to be a dancer i was a dancer so i started moving when I, well, moving, you know, you start to move as soon as you're born. But I started formal movement practice training, ballet training, when I was six. And I went to um, ballet school, dance school, until I was um, 18. And then I, I worked abroad as a dancer and I came back here, did some TV, all of that. Um, until I think I was about 26 or something. But I found yoga through my mum she used to take us to her when we were kids um she used to take us to her keep fit classes and then when I was about mm, 16 15 16 she took me to a yoga class and it blew my mind I think I went with her every week for the summer holidays when I was at home and I just loved it because it gave me a space where I could just clear my mind um, I can't really remember what the poses were that we did 
I remember us doing a seated forward bend with the legs wide and the teacher saying, oh, have a look at Catherine because she can do this. Because as a dancer, obviously, you've got a lot of movement there. But I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in how I felt when I was in the pose Um, because she guided us towards shunyata, towards having an empty mind. And I suppose she must have been quite skilled at that. She was quite an old lady, about 80 or something, um, in a church hall where we weren't allowed to say om or to chant because the villagers thought we were some kind of satanic cult. Um, And, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure if I answered the question. (laughs) No, I think you, oh, you yeah. were talking and, about how you found yoga. <laughs> yeah, so that, how I found yoga was like that. And then I joined I joined any class that I could, sort of off and on, for a while. And I did quite a lot of Shivananda practice because that was what was available near me. And then in the, I suppose it must have been the 80s, when all the health clubs started to proliferate around London and I found this yoga teacher and she was just amazing she wouldn't let me do anything and I was thinking why won't you let me do anything and she she wanted me to hold back and engage I think I was doing an elbow dog and she really 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 held me right back didn't let my bum come up didn't let me go into the full pose and kept saying breathe 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 And by the time I'd finished, I was absolutely knackered. And I thought, gosh, there's something in this. I don't know what she was teaching me, but it wasn't what I normally get from a yoga class. And it turns out that was Scaravelli. That was Alex Gray. So those of you that know Alex, um, I think she's a writer now. But And she introduced me to Diane Long. And then from there, I went and worked for many years with John Sturck, who remains, I, I keep keep in touch I go to his classes regularly now too um and he really taught me most of what I know I would say if not all so that was my journey into it um I, I'm just going to read out a comment we have here from from Faye so in in the the course we're we're running at the, at the moment it's the the pelvis um class that um that we've been doing and Faye says just did today's class and feeling very free and relaxed around the pelvis love the twisting movements interesting to feel the connections with other parts of the body and 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 I think yeah that's something I've always noticed as well as uh, just how much when you practice in this way you do feel all those connections in fact you were just talking there about trying to do elbow dog where you were mm-hmm. were held back and then the, the, the power and strength um in that as well which is um i think i think we it just sounds like a strange thing comment to make but we forget sometimes just how much everything is is connected and in fact um that that class i referenced about with the the feet that you do spend a lot of time focused on the feet, but then you suddenly realise that your back and your neck and your head and your everything feels freer by just focusing on one small element and using it in in a in a really conscious way. I I guess as um, yes, a way I, of looking at. I think that's what interests me. Um, Because John Sturck is an osteopath, what I noticed about his classes was that he would say, oh, do this. So he'd give us the instruction about, I don't know, take the foot and open it up towards your head and then open it out to the side and then breathe. And you might feel your collarbones opening. And nobody before him had said to me, draw my attention to the fact that when you're doing one thing, specific thing like opening your leg out to the side you might feel your collarbones open or you might have a sense of your diaphragm lifting up and creating more space inside your chest and I think it was his osteopathic knowledge and understanding that sort of turned me on to that and showed me that there was definitely more depth available rather than put your right foot here, put your left foot here, put the arm there, the arm there, and then turn your head. And because I'd be standing there thinking, hmm, and. <laughs> um, 
And now I don't stand there thinking, mm, and <laughs> now I'm more engaged. <laughs> So I, that that's just um, making well. I've got I've got I have two questions um, for you. So one is is really about the the way you teach, and you, you've you've explained that with Scaravelli yoga, it is is not just one thing. It's not a, that sort. The, the I think we know lots of other methods of yoga that that are quite prescriptive, whereas with with Scaravelli each teacher finds their own way so it would be really interesting to to hear about the, the areas that you're most interested in in exploring sure. for, for yourself but also in encouraging your students to to explore sure so I I just wanted to make the point that I I feel that all yoga is amazing and those forms of yoga that follow a strict choreography, I think they ha they offer something else. And people who like to move a lot and who need to have plenty of instruction in their head, for whatever reason, it suits some people, um, I think those like Ashtanga the, and the Vinyasa flows where you've got constant changing um, dynamic practice I think they're incredibly helpful because they keep your mind on that one thing so if your mind is a bit jumpy um, or you feel the need to do strong physical work then I think those practices can be super helpful um, it's just I and I used to do them for many years you know if I'd found Scaravelli when I was uh way back at the beginning of my practice I don't think I would have found it very engaging I think I needed to burn off the energy um when I was younger but nowadays um what am I interested in at the moment this red hot week I'm really into the feet Rocky so um yes. <laughs> come to <class. laughs> uh, so I'm I'm all about the feet and how you can really create space between the big toe and the second toe and how your toes can really go right down and the similarities between the architecture of the feet and the hands and how that how we can work with our feet in a more intelligent way to wake up our legs and in waking up our legs perhaps we can wake up the pelvic floor in waking up the pelvic floor can you wake up your spine can you open your chest can you drop your shoulders can you release your jaw from your feet so currently that's my big thing um but i am reading what am i reading it's called I thought I had it right there. It's called In an Unspoken Voice, and it's by Peter Levine. And it's about um, vagal tone and the vagus nerve. I just, some of you know, I just taught a workshop on the vagus nerve. Which, um, I, which I, I participated in. Yeah, I've seen, you did. So, yeah. Um, and I find that really interesting because the reason that I personally practice is because I'm fairly uptight and quite anxious and I need to soothe myself. So obviously over the years I've given it quite some thoughts, you know, why on earth am I doing yoga and not something else? And the reason I keep coming back to yoga is for self-soothing, is for the process of moving towards shunyata, that, that feeling of spaciousness in mind and body and in the reduction of noise that that brings. So just moving myself into a quieter space. So we, in, in fact, we've had a question from um, Susanna who says, I've never done Scaravelli before and found it so interesting to go slowly and feel the subtle differences in the class this morning. My lower back is quite tight, so it seems Scaravelli would be helpful. Do you have any tips? So um, I, I don't know, Suzanne, if you meant specific tips for the back or or practicing Scaravelli um, in general. But I'm I'm going to open both those out to you, Catherine, because I, I think that there is that that sense of subtlety which you just alluded to there. It in what interests you as as well as so. 
I, I just thought we'd, we'd add in Susanna's question there. Sure. Um, so, Susanna, lower back, I presume that's what you're talking about, lower back issues, fairly common. Um, and mine is fairly grumbly from time to time as well, for some reason. Um, generally, I feel that keep moving with lower back issues as much as you can, but not extreme movements. So mobilizing simple movements, the most simple movements, like lying on the ground and just very simple pelvic tilts can be enormously helpful because they're not a big movement. They're quite soothing intrinsically. And indeed, if you rock the body, um, you can any kind of rocking sideways, backwards, forwards. This is very soothing for your vagus nerve as well. And if you're suffering with some kind of um, pain or discomfort, then the most important thing you can do is to bring yourself into a state of calm. Because um, when we're agitated, that stimulates the flow of cortisol, which literally acts like lemon juice on a paper cut, makes it worse, makes you experience your discomfort more powerfully um, and makes it stand out from all the other sensations that you are experiencing. So soothe yourself, slow your breathing. And as you move with any injury or issue that you're working with, the most important thing is don't go there if it hurts. I know it sounds blindingly obvious, um, but so many people do. They, they, you know, you've got a toothache, so you go, oh, does it hurt? Does it hurt if I press here? Does it hurt if I press here? Does it hurt if I press here? And we tend to do that. We tend to kind of agitate our pain spots. Or if I'm feeling a bit stiff, I might go, oh, oh, how far can I stretch before I feel the, the resistance? Um, just to see if it's still there. It's a kind of a, it's a human thing, I guess. Yeah, we're gluttons for punishment, aren't we? Really, I think it is a yeah. is a bizarre human thing that we do seem to to um, to to do that needle where it um, where it hurts. We 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 had a, a someone sent in a, a question um, as well about um, starting a, a home practice, um, a Scaravelli home practice, um, and and this was a question from Cleo who who said that that's something that she'd really like to do but but isn't sure where how to start a Scarafelli home practice and where to start and did mm. you have any any insight to shed on that yeah interesting isn't it um from time to time I teach workshops on this and it's quite interesting to find out why people want to do their own practice and really dive in there and ask them you know why do you and quite often people come up with the answer I feel I should and I always think that's it's not a great motivator is it it's a bit like saying well you should take your medicine um <laughs> it kind of, it's not very sexy so if if it's because you think you should then I think we need another another answer and I'm not suggesting for a second that Cleo is is in that camp but it's something that comes up um so how to start really there are a couple of ways it depends where you are in your own practice yeah. if you're right at the very beginning of your practice then what I suggest to people is maybe get a book doesn't matter what book, but a book of an instruction manual of yoga poses and flick through it and see which ones you find helpful, which ones you are intrinsically drawn to and practice them. Um, simply lay out your mat. If you don't have a mat, doesn't matter. Get a little corner of your room where you can be quiet and undisturbed for 20 minutes and explore how those poses make you feel go into them come out go into them come out dive in and really give yourself time to experience the pose time to feel how you feel afterwards and then do it again um because it's difficult without a teacher it's 
difficult to sustain your practice without a teacher. And it's difficult to decide whether what you're doing is appropriate. And I feel that that question has a lot to do with confidence about, you know, how do I move my body? Will I hurt myself? And I, I usually say to people, it's very unlikely you're going to hurt yourself. Most people have a fairly good idea of what is going to be possible for them without the teacher present and what might be just a bit too far. Um, although, hey, I've seen plenty of YouTube videos where people are practicing inversions in their living room and put their foot through the lamp or whatever it is into the TV screen. So maybe clear the room first <laughs> before you experiment. Um, but really is to see what are you interested in? Because genuine, gen, generally, can't speak today, generally, if I'm doing my practice, it tends to be that I lay down my mat, I put myself on the mat, and I breathe for a few minutes, and I see what movements my body makes. Um, but I am aware that I've got this long history of formal movement. So my body just kind of goes into stuff that it's familiar with. Whereas if you don't have that long legacy of training, you might be thinking to yourself, what, what should I do? And can you get out of your head and into your body and breathe and feel and maybe use some inspiration from books or videos. You know, like lots of people have said to me, oh, I love your foot class or I love your pelvis class or whatever. So maybe do one of those classes. And if there's something in there that you find is particularly helpful, take it off the video into your living room and do it without my voice. And you will find that that develops your own voice because you'll remember some of the things that I said. And then Maybe you'll find yourself talking along with my voice, with the teacher's voice. And then maybe your voice will say, oh, but I feel this. And that's the beginning of you exploring something that is uniquely you um, and will be more beneficial than anything that a teacher could give you. And sorry, Rahi, I'm just going to carry on here for a little bit. Um, Because what was I going to say? It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. I was I was off on one, and it was coming, and then it just disappeared out of my head. It'll come back. Well, might, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully it will. But I was I was going to say it's it's good to be playful, isn't it? I think that's that's what I, I think you you said. Don't don't be scared, and um, mm. and what I also heard was don't be scared of playing. I think is 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 great because I I think. And, and I, I don't know if the question was whether Cleo has a, an established home practice in a, a different style of yoga and wants to explore a, a Scaravelli approach more. But, you know, I think I think really paying and listening to to your own voice and what your body needs is probably a, a great way in. And, and, you know, that's I think what you were saying. And, and as you said, maybe don't don't stick your feet through through the lamp doing an inversion <laughs> but um but i not you're unless not... you're videoing it and then you put it onto youtube and give me a link so that i can see it and laugh <laughs> Stop it. but but yeah i think i think that that it you know it is about playing and in fact what you were saying about taking little elements and i i i, I mainly practice vinyasa yoga i teach vinyasa yoga but i stick in all sorts of things i i stick in anything that that feels good to me that my body likes and hopefully other people will take something away from that um but i think i think sometimes we get a bit serious like overly serious with with yoga and we should be playful because it at the end of the day it should make us feel joyful shouldn't it and i think sometimes that kind of real focus on different parts of our body can release a sense of 
a sense of wonderment, can't it? That we 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 are amazing. <laughs> we we've developed this amazing. I think you were talking about um, in your your vagus nerve workshop. It, it's extraordinary how the human body has evolved and, and and what we can do both physically, but emotionally and mentally as well. It's it's extraordinary, isn't it? We are amazing, and our ability to adapt is amazing. I mean, you know, here we are in the midst of this uh, corona episode, and there will come a point, I'm, I'm quite sure, because the body is amazing, where some of us create or develop immunity to this bug, whether that's through uh, vaccinations or this herd immunity you know enough of us will have caught it at a low level to um, build up our inner immunity and I remember talking to a um, somebody in the hospital years and years ago I was there for a scan for something and he said the one thing he would never do is have a flu vaccine because he said the, the human body is much better at fighting off these things than anything that the drug companies can put into us and I thought that was really amazing considering he was working within the health service and you know just talking about the the amazing power of the body and when I think about my own body in terms of um, how I've adapted after having had an injury um, how my body has healed after having injuries and how my movement is now just as good as it was before. As long as we keep ourselves moving, then we will keep ourselves moving. You know, I think, um, I think that's probably the, the main takeaway that I have about the body. Just don't abuse it too much. And I think we're just going back to Van der Scar Scaravelli for, for a minute. There are all these amazing photographs of, her at, at, at an advanced age mm. doing extraordinary things and as, as you said she she started her yoga practice when she was in her late 40s which um which is when a lot of people are saying oh I can't move quite as well as I could once so it mm. it is amazing that keeping how keeping the body mobile and active can actually serve us in in the long term um, I think it's really important to stay positive um, and optimistic because I was just talking to somebody and, and they were saying, oh, they'd gone to this most amazing class led by somebody who specializes in teaching seniors and seniors are people over 50, which kind of freaked me out because I thought, oh, OK, so I'm in the seniors group, am I? And apparently I should no longer be practicing headstands. <laughs> Um, for whatever risk and I just think why why give people a limit you know why say over such and such an age you shouldn't do headstand and unless they've got a particular issue which stops them from doing headstand you know if, if they are 55 and still enjoy doing headstand then I don't why not you know mm -hmm. um I just I feel that we we tend to kind of pigeonhole people. I mean, I would be furious if I was in a class told, you know, oh, Catherine, don't do this. Um, you're too old. Be like, okay, <laughs> make me want to do it even more. Yeah, but what? Well, that's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Um, and and yeah. and yes, and it's a fu it's funny, isn't it? How we do we do um, we pigeonhole at, at at every end. I I teach. I teach kids as well, and I'm currently teaching a kind of completely mixed group. And I've got eight-year-olds, and I've got their mums, and and then I have people that are much older, and and it's fine. You know, maybe the eight-year-olds don't understand everything I say, but mostly they get, and they keep coming back. And one of them now doesn't let her mum come because it's become her thing. So, you know why not she enjoys it she's getting some she obviously feels good she's coming every week so but it's it's funny how it's our it's our minds isn't it it's our heads that tell us we should and we shouldn't and going back to what you were saying about should and shouldn't and how we impose these 
things on on ourselves that that aren't there that who, who's to say you yeah. can't do it or couldn't do it I know I mean my dad is 90 and my students are fed up with me saying this but he still goes to the gym well not currently but before lockdown was still going to the gym three times a week doing crossfit and climbing up the rope and ringing the bell in the gym much to his trainer's um concern because I think they were worried that he was going to fall down the road but um you know he's 90 and he still wants to do that and still feels that he can and so he will and down the road from where my folks live in Kent there was a an old lady who was I think she was 90 odd before she died and she died of pneumonia but when they went into um, into her house, they realised that she didn't have a staircase up to her bedroom. She had a ladder, and yeah. she was going up to bed in in her bedroom until she died. Um, so keep on doing it until you really can't. Otherwise, yeah. you won't be able to do it. Yeah, and 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 don't let your head or someone else's head tell you. Otherwise, it's it's. No. I think it's going back to what you were saying about listening to to your body and and not letting the mind override. Sometimes it's it's our heads all saying we're bored or let's move on or we can't do it. Yeah. You know we're fifty. Yes. So. I can't do it or um yeah I'm bored. They they're very they get restrictive those kinds of things when you say them when you allow yourself to believe the message you know if you're bored with something then ask yourself you know what would i have to do to make it interesting um why is my foot not interesting me today or is there another part of my body that's more interesting to me today calling to me today uh, and trying to keep yourself stimulated you know um reading i mean we've got so much access these days to amazing books and sources of information i mean i am bombarded with stuff on zoom amazing teachers like donna fari just came and taught a workshop recently and she is an a wonderful inspiration she fell off her horse and really damaged her pelvis and she would the medical authorities wanted to pin her bones back together but she worked on her on herself doing small targeted pelvic stability exercises and she showed us the before and after um x-ray of her pelvis mm. and the change is remarkable you can really see it was pretty fallen apart in the beginning and now not perfect but very much more bound together and much more stable and she moves amazingly so if you put your mind to it you really are quite magical and um, you just have to believe that I think absolutely and I, I was actually going to you've touched on it there but I was going to ask you about inspiration in fact because I think in I think I've been struck in 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 your classes um, that it you are you are really it, you are one of the teachers that, that I've practiced with the most that, that really takes insp draws inspiration from all sorts of incredible things. So I was going to ask you where where you find your inspiration and and because I think you mentioned that earlier as well when we were talking to Cleo who says thank you by the way oh, um, and, and that that was a helpful answer but um you, you were talking about finding inspiration so I was I was going to ask you if you have any um suggestions for how people find inspiration for their exploration in within their yoga practice mm. yeah if, if you if you have or how you find inspiration because you you do seem to draw on it from all sorts of Oh, sources and places. That is a good question. Um, well, my injuries have been quite helpful. I don't wish injury on anybody, but um, any time I've had something go slightly wrong, I immediately do a deep dive into what that is, what's going on for me, 
um, and what kinds of things might help. And at the moment, I'm I'm inspired by um, our nervous system, I guess. Not the kind of nuts and bolts of where do the nerves run, but how we feel. So hence the interest in the vagus. How we how our bodies interpret sensation. So and I don't oh Rocky, where do I find that information from? I've been reading, as I said, Peter Levine, and then inevitably what happens is you read a book and then something else springs up. I mean, Facebook is full of all kinds of amazing um suggestions and pointers. I also follow Medium, which is a an online journalism magazine thing, and they have a, a fantastic range of health um, writers who write all kinds of things, total nonsense to absolute wonderful stuff. And I never quite know where that's going to lead me. So I kind of I kind of wend my way through social media, finding stuff, and then following up on it, I suppose. Um, yeah and um, and and you you mentioned um the nervous system there and was that you 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 also talked about um feeling um anxiety and wanting to explore where where some of that came from but but it has that inspiration that interest in the nervous system come come primarily from from yourself or was there something else that that triggered that that interest in uh, blah, 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 blah. I, I suppose it's from from my experiences from what I need to learn um yeah really what and, I need to learn and I guess that is in fact how we all find our inspiration we we, we are constantly presented aren't we with, with what it is we need to learn or what what it is we find challenging and then until we we explore them or, or or really kind of look at them head on and try to find our way through that it's going to keep coming back isn't it and then and then they they do become our our source of inspiration for whatever reason if it's just as a, a way of I don't want to feel like this anymore mm. or you start to think how how fascinating I think um you know I, I can tell that the nervous system has become a source of fascination for for you as well that how how does that how does that work and and the fact yeah. that it's so different for everyone as well how we feel and um I I remember at the end of my teacher the teach training I did I can still remember asking the question of what are what are feelings what are thoughts and what are feelings and yeah. that, uh, there isn't a, a simple answer to that one but it it is fascinating like you know what are feelings it is it's fascinating, yeah isn't it? it is I mean also not just me but students like um a while ago somebody phoned me up and said could I help she was having difficulties experiencing pain and when she arrived it was obvious that Really, she had no, I could not help her. Um, she had been suffering extreme pain for about 10 years to the point where climbing downstairs would leave her in pain for a couple of days afterwards. And I spoke to my physiotherapist friend and she said, yeah, there's a crossover between how you first initially experience pain which is um you know you prick your finger and you experience the pain of the sharp prick and then later on you keep feeling the pain even though there's no apparent reason for you to feel that pain so the nervous system does something um and it creates like a short circuit so you continually feel the pain even though there's no reason for you to be feeling the pain and I'm very interested in that because that seems to me to be one of those things where it would be easy to say to that person, it's all in your mind. And it's not all in the mind. It is in her body as well. But why is it in her body? Why is it still in her body? Why do we 
experience things and associate them so clearly with certain outcomes, either positive or negative? And how do we change that if we feel that we are misinterpreting signals? And there's a, a wonderful YouTube speech, and I can't remember for the life of me who it is, but it's a guy talking about his experience walking through the bush and feeling a little nick on his leg and thinking that was razor grass. And it wasn't razor grass at all. It was a very deadly snake, just nicked him. And he woke up three days later in ICU, um, nearly having died. And so next time he was walking through razor grass, he felt a little nick, thought that it was the same thing, a bite, and went into all kinds of shock and fear. And it was just the razor grass. So that kind of association i think is fascinating all to do with survival of course but yeah totally, totally amazing and and interesting to explore how how you can change those um those neural pathways um too so i i you touched on this before um but i was going to ask you if you feel that there's a certain kind of person that that would particularly enjoy Scaravelli yoga, or, or to put the question in a mm. crass way, who who is Scaravelli yoga for? So people <laughs> people are watching this and thinking, I don't, I don't, I've heard about Scaravelli, I'm not quite sure what it is. I wonder if I would like, apart from obviously have a go, because how can you know? But but beyond that, is there is there a certain kind of person it, it would appeal to you or, or that you feel would, would benefit from, from this? So, so when I discovered it, the thing that I found was most intriguing about it was that it would take me deeper into poses in a way that I hadn't really explored before because we tend to spend more time exploring each pose and I was going to say thinking about it but feeling into it more deeply for longer with a slightly different approach from what I'd experienced in other yoga forms. Um, I think if you want to jump around and get hot and sweaty and you need to move a lot this might not be your cup of tea but for people who are maybe working with, if you're normally the jumping around kind of person, but you've just suffered an injury and you want to take it a bit slower, you might find it really useful to come to a Scaravelli class and see whether some of the things that we cover could be taken into your Ashtanga class or your Vinyasa class later um, to, to increase your understanding of the poses as you're doing them more quickly and more dynamically. Um, if you have long-term conditions that are not likely to change, like I've worked with a few people with um, cerebral palsy, for instance, they find this slower approach is quite good because it gives them time to get into the pose. But also people who are interested in moving easily for life who are interested in understanding what their body is doing in some of the really quite extreme poses can be very helpful for people who are hypermobile, so who have more mobility than the normal, because we tend to hold you back a little bit, which can be more stabilizing for you. People who are interested in a more meditative approach to yoga uh, it could feed you as well and anyone who's interested in exploring functional movement um, a sort of an anatomically driven approach to movement I think would find these classes helpful um, so I, I hope that answers your question regardless of age or ability it's it's really not about that it's it's more about us learning to feel, um, to really feel what we're doing. So one of the most common questions I get asked by people who are just beginning yoga is, what should I be feeling? And 
most of the time I will tip that back and say, well, what do you feel? And you find that people at the beginning, they're not quite sure how to trust themselves. So this form of yoga can help you gradually to learn to really listen in and then to build your own trust for your own practice and your own body. That's my that's, point. That, that I was thinking that's really fascinating what, what you said about people saying, what should I be feeling or, or where should I be feeling it and, and and in a sense I guess you should be feeling it where 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 you feel it or what what you feel is is what you feel and 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 then as you said trying to discern whether that's appropriate inappropriate or whether you're you're doing yourself an injury because you're doing something crazy <laughs> which you might, you might be about to kick the the tv over um <laughs> But um, but it, but that is really interesting, and I think that that that's almost brought us to where we began this conversation with that sense of trusting your own voice, which I think is um, is quite often we want someone else to tell us tell us because it's easier rather than explore what what's necessarily right for us, isn't it? Or because not the same thing as you said, one size doesn't fit fit all in there. And this is a way to explore that really, isn't it? What what am I yeah. like? And it, it's about very often when we go into a classroom, we regress to how we were when we were at school because our last potentially, very often, the last memory that we have of being in a taught situation was school time and so in that dynamic the teacher kind of knew best as as the appropriate adult in the room and they would very often have quite a sense of power or they would have power over you the learner and I think in a yoga class it's different and it needs to be different and all these scandals that you see that are happening around the yoga world, sadly, I think are when the teacher doesn't recognize that that it's not I'm the teacher, you're the student. It's a collaboration always between me, a person with so many years of experience, and you coming to me to have a little bit of guidance about where I might go. You know, all I am is a signpost. I'm, I'm sort of pointing you in this direction and saying, well, what happens when you travel down this path? Do you see how your feet work if you do this? And then, oh, because I've now kind of traveled down that road for long enough, let's go here. Let's see how does the collarbone feel? How does the shoulder blade feel? Let's explore what happens if we move in this way. Um, and the teacher is literally a guide not somebody who tells you what to do. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important for us as teachers is to recognise that. And I think it's 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 a, an interesting thing for students to to hear as well because I think it um, it it kind of makes makes it a little more challenging as well to to not blindly follow but to to really work at it and sort of to really mine what it is that that, that you're you're feeling and and exploring because it because sometimes it can it can just be nice to just to kind of go in, into that almost rote let's just do this without really you know let's check out in the mind and the body and just move mechanically and it's it's comfortable to abdicate responsibility quite often um and there's nothing wrong with that and I think that's quite often why people come to a class because they don't want to have to develop their own practice and that's fine but within that practice where I'm suggesting that now we do downward dog within that downward dog I'm asking for my students, take responsibility for what you're doing in there. I'll give you all kinds of clues and cues and suggestions, things for you to get into. But ultimately, you are the one. It's your body. You're, you've got to do the work. Um, and 
I enjoy that from my teachers, you know, when they give me lots of space to do whatever I want to, and they're just giving me little hints and suggestions, and I'll take that off and go in my own path. I don't have to be following them and doing exactly the same movement of the arm that they're doing, for instance. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting, isn't it, to explore areas that are, that are new to you you hadn't thought about in the in the same way but then once someone said well what about this I, I know in a, a class of yours I I did fairly recently you were talking about doing doing less or undoing in fact I think is what what you'd said and and I found that such an interesting cue as well I and it's it stuck with me because I thought well that's a really interesting thing to explore that kind of sense of yoga not as as doing but as as undoing and and that sense of softness that that gave me within a structure because I think we were doing we were working quite hard at the time but it was a sense of you know freedom around the the breath as well so it it's it's an in, in, an interesting um relationship actually that that I think you've you've put to us today to to explore that relationship between teacher and our own body as teacher and and ourselves and our minds so there, there's all sorts going on within what might seem like you're just exploring the foot or the pelvis but there's a lot more yeah I think what we're doing when I think about what, we, what you've just said is that we are unpicking our conditioning so I might move in particular ways because of particular things that have happened to me over my life, trainings that I've done, injuries I've sustained, um, relationships that I've had, you know, my musculature, my tissues will hold on in a particular way. And in yoga, we're becoming aware of that and then we are undoing it so that we can become aware of other alternative potentials. So we might end up moving more freely as a result of understanding that our shoulder was holding on because we had a frozen shoulder 10 years ago. You know, it's not there anymore. So undo it. You know, we're no longer doing endless repetitive mouse work with one or the other arm. So learn to soften that shoulder, find a little bit more movement. You know, it's, it's undoing those conditioned movement patterns. And that can be really liberating because it can you can suddenly think oh my god the potential is enormous um which can be liberating or it can be a bit scary sometimes <laughs> yeah but as as we've said you can you can be 90 and and you know be doing headstands and as you know if our bodies can do it our bodies can do it um yeah sometimes our our minds don't um don't like that do they um well so. sometimes we feel the need for a bit of safety and and familiarity and i think it's it's honest and it's only natural to to look for that if if that's what you need at the time because tomorrow you might feel much more adventurous you know nothing stays the same yeah and that that's an important lesson to learn as well i think what what you were saying about we're no longer moving that mouse in, in that way so our, our shoulder could could be freer but it is thinking about those patterns and 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 those habits and we can just get into the habit of oh i can't do this today and then when we get to tomorrow we think well i couldn't do it yesterday so i won't go there today whereas i guess we need to look at each moment as a as a fresh moment to to try and see what we can do in that moment, really. I think that's really important, definitely. So, well, we are, at the time has just flown past. Kat's um, posted a, a comment. She said, such interesting thoughts about self-inquiry and home practice and properly checking in for what our, our bodies need. Love that so much. Um, and and it's true, it's uh, the simplest and yet the, the most difficult thing I think sometimes about yoga is is listening to our own bodies because I think in many ways we've forgotten to to listen or, or how to listen to them because we've had a lifetime of 
listening to other people telling us or overriding the messages that we probably did here, but we're like, no, I, I don't, I can't, I can't do that now, or I, I, you know, so I'll just keep doing this other thing, and then we stop, we stop listening and hearing that. Yeah, so. yeah. and society's mes- messages, you know, you, as a woman, you don't lift that because it'll be too heavy for you, or um, as an older person, don't do that because you're too old, or don't do that, you're too young, you can't look after yourself. You know, there are all these sort of cultural messages that we've grown up with and they're different depending on on where you were brought up and um how that society organizes itself but it's all conditioned into us into our very cellular makeup so not feeling that we have to adhere to that so sometimes yeah. being a bit brave a bit radical even absolutely um and 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 yeah, we have an answer. Scaravelli is about being brave. So maybe it is about looking at at those places that that you might be scared to. Well, maybe scared as a slightly OTT, but you know, places we might not have visited yet within within ourselves. Um, so um, yeah, and Kat saying yes to radical and brave. Yes, we can go there, Kat. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's been really fascinating. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. Um, it's been it's been great, and um, and and thank you for your your lovely classes. And I just say to everyone listening to this that go and go and try out those classes. And if you haven't done the foot class, do it. <laughs> it's great. Um, um, and 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 there's a really good shoulder one and a spine one too. There are all sorts of. Um, and they feel like journeys, actually. I think your classes do feel like you've been on a, a really interesting in journey. So um, I I recommend that at this time we can't travel anywhere else. I suggest traveling within with with Catherine as a as a guide. Um, yeah, inner world. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for for. Um, for chatting and I think if people may not be watching this live but if people are watching this again then you know if you want to continue to post questions then um, I'm sure Catherine will take a look um, and and be able to to respond as well but um, I wanted to say thank you to everyone um, watching and asking questions um, and and thank you to you too Catherine for for taking the time to come and chat chat to me today it's been brilliant thank you so well, much thank you it's been an absolute pleasure really nice to hear from all the movement from modern lifers and Kat as well thank you so much for making this possible it's just an amazing platform so guys if you haven't already explored it go now make it your thing to do on a Tuesday evening um, and hope to see you there soon brilliant Thank you all very much. Thank you.